Welcome to the Innovation Engineer Podcast, your favorite place for picking the brains of your favorite engineers. So grab your nerdiest mug, fill it with a beverage of choice, and enjoy. My name is Tarek, and today I will talk to Sean Cleaver, an industrial manager at Airbus Defense and Space. This alone is already exciting, but Sean is working on the ESM, the European Service Module of the Orion spacecraft, which is part of the Artemis project. Technically, I won't talk to Sean today, because this session was recorded two months ago. But since we are approaching the launch of Artemis 1, now seems to be the best time to have an innovator from the Artemis project on the podcast. If you have any remarks or questions for Sean, please post them in the comments, because I will definitely invite her back for a follow-up after the launch. And now, I hand over to Past Me and Sean. Today I have the pleasure of talking to Sean Cleaver. Sean is not only an amazing person, but she's also a spacecraft engineer at Airbus Defense and Space in Bremen. But it gets even better because Sean is working on the Orion spacecraft, which is part of the Artemis program. So maybe let's start by introducing yourself. Who are you and how did you end up in spacecraft engineering? Hi, um, yes, so I'm Sean, uh, Sean Cleaver. Fever. And I, like you say, I'm a spacecraft engineer working for Airbus Defence and Space in Bremen in Germany. Actually, my job title is an industrial manager, but I can tell you a bit more about what that actually means in a bit. Um, but in terms of my route into the space industry, I think I was about four or five years old when I told my parents that I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to go into space, do spacey things. And from then on, that became my thing that was all i was interested in um i started to have an interest in astronomy and the stars um i had a little telescope uh things like that when i was younger um and then that sort of guided me through school through university i studied physics um and then i kind of got to the point where i was like right well being an astronaut is pretty difficult but there must be other opportunities in the space industry um can i somehow and help to make spacecraft. And I didn't realize at the time that that is a spacecraft engineer. Um, but luckily I managed to find the company, uh, I was in the UK at the time, the company, the biggest company that's building spacecraft there, Airbus. Um, and then I started working there. And then from then on, yeah, found myself working on some really, really cool missions. I've done all sorts of things in the years that I've been with Airbus. Yeah, this sounds amazing. Maybe um, what brought you to Germany? Yeah, so um, I was working mostly on like science and exploration missions when I was back in the UK. Some really cool stuff, don't get me wrong. Um, I worked on Solar Orbiter, which um, is right um, up there now. Um, it's orbiting the sun um, and it's taking really cool pictures closer than we've ever been to the sun before. So I did that for a while. Um, but then I kind of got to the point where I was just thinking, I just want to work on human space flight. I want to be as close to astronauts as I can be. That for me is the really exciting stuff. And I kind of got wind that um, Airbus in Germany were working on um, what's called the Orion European Service Module pro Project. Um, and it's part of NASA's Ar Artemis missions. Um, and this is human space flight, about as good as it gets, really. They're essentially building um, a part of the rocket and a service module that will help to keep the astronauts alive on their journey to the moon. And as soon as I heard about that, I thought, right, that's it. I need to um, move <laughs> from Airbus UK over to Airbus Germany and be involved in this really exciting project. And I've been there, what, three years now, and I'm loving it. It's such a good project. Yeah, it sounds amazing when you talk about this. And uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people who want to follow in your footsteps. So um, what would be the academic paths or career options that someone needs to take or could take um, if they want to have a job like um, at Airbus Defense and Space? Yes, yeah, so my route was probably quite a classical route into spacecraft engineering. Um, so I studied the STEM subjects as much as I could when I was younger. Um, so I had a, um, a British education, so I did GCSEs. Um, and then I went on to do A-levels. And my A-levels were um, physics, maths, chemistry, geography and general studies. Um, and I also took um, some lessons in Russian on the side because I thought that might be useful in the space industry. So that was what I did at school. And then I uh, decided that for me, I'm quite academic um, and I thought that university would be a good fit. So I went on to Durham University in the north of the UK uh, and I studied physics and astrophysics there um, because astrophysics was the real thing that I was interested in. I wasn't so fascinated by all of the nitty gritty physics behind it. I just wanted to do the astrophysics part. Um, and so that's why that course really appealed to me. But I mean, 
a lot of our engineers do go to university and they do either physics or more commonly engineering degrees, but that's not the only way in. Um, some of the big, well, most of the big um, spacecraft um, companies, so Airbus included, they will have uh, graduate schemes, but also apprenticeship schemes. And quite a lot of people come in through the apprenticeship route. Um, I know in Germany, they do um, like a traineeship program where you can kind of study in parallel to um, learning on the job really so there's loads of different ways in you don't have to be super academic and go down the university route you can go um, towards the more practical route as well if that's what interests you yeah yeah I, I could imagine I mean uh, probably every single part um, of the crew that is working on the spacecraft is is like a hero or should be celebrated like a hero even like the space plumber who builds the the toilet on <laughs> on the Orion spacecraft. <laughs> well, exactly, because I mean, at the end of the day, for any engineering project, it only works if everybody is doing their job and if every single piece and part fits together perfectly and works together perfectly harmoniously. So that's what engineering is all about. So you're absolutely right in that respect. You know, the project manager is just as important as the person who's physically assembling the spacecraft or and also just as important as somebody who's, you know, deep in the technical details of one specific valve. So everybody has their part to play on, on this program. Yeah, it's, it sounds amazing. Uh, what is your favorite thing or task of your job? <laughs> so I should tell you a little bit more about what my job actually is. So industrial manager is a bit of a, a weird term. Um, I think really what my job is more about is, um, so when we build something like the European service module, when we build a part of a spacecraft or a spacecraft itself, um, then we have, we don't build everything by ourselves as Airbus or as any big space company. We rely on other companies providing either parts, components or whole subsystems. So um, we have a whole sort of consortium of subcontractors that we work together with. And we buy things from them. We, we maybe order, um, I don't know, um, like a, a power system from somewhere or a propulsion system from somewhere. Um, and they, that company then has to develop it and make it. And my job as industrial manager is to make sure that everything is delivered on time, exactly when we need it, so that we can build it up into our spacecraft exactly in the right time and in the right sequence. And that probably sounds quite straightforward if you're thinking of buying things off a shelf or from a, from a company. But actually, when you come to talking about space, a lot of these things have never been made before or they've been made before but they've been specifically adapted for our mission um, and so there's a lot of development and testing work that goes into um, to make something so every single system or subsystem that we've got on board of our spacecraft has gone through years of development and testing and sometimes things pop up things aren't quite right or something isn't working exactly perfectly um, and so part of my job is to try to to work out what's going on, why this thing is potentially going to be a little bit delayed and what we can do about it to um, sort of help them solve the problem and make sure that it does come in time um, so that it doesn't disrupt the whole assembly of our spacecraft. I mean, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to build our spacecraft and deliver it to our customer, the European Space Agency, so they can transfer it to NASA exactly when, when it's needed. We don't want to be holding up all these Artemis missions just because we're late. Yeah. Did, did this happen before that something like a like a launch was delayed because someone messed up or someone did not deliver a, a particular part in time? I don't think it's ever as straight cut as, you know, one part was late or one person messed up, for example. Um, with space, you quite often see um, delays and schedules for many different reasons. But I think for our program, it's mostly because it's a human spaceflight program. And when you're doing human spaceflight, you can't take any risks. So we have to make sure that everything is absolutely perfect. Everything is to the highest quality that it can possibly be. And so if something isn't quite falling within those bounds, then we would rather, you know, fix it, do our job properly, make sure it works and, you know, take a slight delay than we would just go ahead and launch just to stick to a date. So it's kind of a balancing act. I mean, yes, there's a schedule, there's deadlines, but for, for programs such as ours, human spaceflight, then really the safety comes above all else at the moment. Yeah, I, I, to I 
I totally agree and I think everyone will totally agree about this one. But I would love to learn more about the Artemis program itself. What do we hope to achieve with the several Artemis missions uh, in total? W what are our goals there? So Artemis um, in the first phase is going back to the moon. So we last went to the moon, what, over 50 years ago now. And actually we've not been back since. Um, and so now, the reason why we're going back now is not just because, you know, because we can and because we want to do it again, it's fun, I mean, all of those things, but more important is the fact that we're sort of moving towards the next chapter in, in space exploration. We're thinking about, can we go and explore other planets? So Mars is on the horizon. But to get to Mars, there's a huge leap needed in terms of the technology and in terms of... Um, you know, our capabilities to get there. So what's happening now is that um, NASA um, with the Artemis missions is returning to the moon, but this time we're going with the view to building up a bit more for sustainable human presence on the moon. We're bringing infrastructure. We're trying to see if we can, um, you know, make use of the moon's resources to sustain human life. And with everything that we learn and develop from these missions, we will use that expertise when we go on to Mars, which, which will be coming. Um, and there's also the idea that we can use the moon as a sort of stepping stone towards Mars. So not just in terms of a technological stepping stone, but also a physical stepping stone. If you can get to, let's say, an orbiting gateway space station that's around the moon, the energy that's required to go from there onto Mars is significantly less than it would be to go directly from Earth to Mars. So that's really where we're headed. That's the direction that people are thinking about. Um, and the Artemis program kind of encapsulates all of those elements. So Artemis is not just the rocket that will launch my spacecraft and some astronauts to the moon. Artemis also refers to the whole concept of, you know, taking other components, other bits of infrastructure and and all of the missions together. That's what Artemis really means. Yeah, and, and you already mentioned like these different components um, apart from the spacecraft itself. Like uh, I know there's this this lunar space station that is uh, that is planned and the human landing module that is going to the surface then. Um, how will this uh, work together and um, how will traveling to the moon look like after um, everything is built up? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of it is still to be defined um, as, far as, as far as I'm aware. So, I mean, we know that the first missions, um, so the very first one, Artemis 1, that'll be a test mission. Um, so no crew on board um, and the spacecraft will orbit the moon and carry out lots of tests on all of its onboard systems systems and then come back. Artemis 2 is when we will take a crew of astronauts around the moon again. They won't land on the moon with this mission, but they'll be doing more tests, you know, proving capabilities and um, checking that everything's working okay. And then with the third one, that's when astronauts will descend to the surface. So in some sort of lunar lander um, and then touch down on, on the moon's surface. And that, to give you an idea of time scales, that, that should be around about 2025 that that um, touchdown happens um, and so it's kind of it's a bit different to the Apollo missions this time because different companies are doing different parts of the project now so um, there are private space companies now um, doing studies and and proving that they can deliver um, certain aspects so like the landing system or um, you know parts of this gateway that will be orbiting around the moon that that's the, the name of the space station so it's it's a real collaborative effort this time round. It looks a little bit different to the Apollo missions in that respect. Um, and also that's kind of why it's a little bit undefined at the moment. Things are being designed with the ultimate goal in mind, but um, at the moment, all those pieces don't exist yet. They're all either in the development stage or, or being built. Um, and only when all those bits sort of come together over the years will we start to sort of really define what Artemis 4, 5, 6 and so on looks like in terms of the mission concept. But I think if I'm, you know, really dreaming ahead, I think the vision is to have astronauts on the surface carrying out experiments, um, testing out technologies, building maybe little habitats where they can stay for days, weeks at a time, um, an orbiting gateway, um, infrastructure to help communications um, back to Earth, that sort of thing, and, and numerous sort of uh, lunar landers and, and maybe moon buggies, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of different aspects that need to come together to make the Artemis program. 
Yeah, right. Uh, you just said something that I, I actually never thought about, like Artemis 5, 6, 7, 8. Is this program going to be uh, continued indefinitely or is there like like a strict plan? We are going to Artemis 10 and then Artemis is over. As far as I'm aware, there's no clear end point And that's deliberate because it's very much we want to go to Mars. And I imagine that those missions will be like a natural continuation of the Artemis program, maybe under another name. I, I really don't know. But certainly at Airbus, we are under contract now to provide European service modules one to six, and we're hoping to win the contract to build seven to nine. So that kind of gives you the certainty that up to Artemis nine, things are good. This is all going ahead. Um, so yeah, that's that's many years of work anyway. That makes <laughs> makes me happy because I'm in a job right up until, you know, Artemis nine if right. I want to. So <laughs> yeah, that's reassuring. Sure. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're very focused on um, the Artemis program and um, working on this capsule. But do you or your colleagues sometimes wonder if the Chinese, for example, build like the equivalent program and will build like a base camp in the, in the neighboring crater or something like that so that we will have like several camps on, on the surface on the moon? That's a really good point. Um, I haven't actually thought about that before. I suppose it's possible. Um, there are other nations with um, great capabilities. But I think the one thing that I think we've all learned in the last 50 years or so in space is that we do the best things when we collaborate together. Space has become a lot more international um, in the last 50 years. I mean, look at the International Space Station. That's got um, European elements, it's got American elements, and also Russian elements all working together. So my feeling is that something as big as going to the moon and going to the moon in a sort of sustainable way can only really be achieved effectively and cost effectively too when a lot of nations work together. So my hope would be that um, if other nations were interested in doing that, then they would team up and collaborate and do it together because I really think that that's when you get the best solutions and that's when you make the most progress is when you work together as a sort of humankind together. That's true. And uh, the ISS was a beautiful example of international collaboration and um, these mixed crews um, living and researching together. It was really beautiful. And now that the ISS is going to be retired in the next 10 years, do you think that a similar way of handling the crews on the base station um, on, on the moon, will this be like uh, similar to this? Or will the, the uh, station on the moon be abandoned after um, the crews landed there. What do you mean? Like as in there'll be like a continued presence in that space? Thing? Right, right. Like, like the ISS. Yeah. I mean, from what I've read that the initial missions will be sort of weeks at a time. Um, so the Apollo missions for just to, to compare were only sort of days, maybe a week um, to get there and back. And these ones will be more in the, in the, region of, I think, weeks to months in duration. Given that we're sort of launching one of these each year, let's say roughly, that makes me think that there won't be exactly, you know, people there the whole year round. But that's not to say that we don't move in that direction further down the line, you know. I think that that would always be the goal, would be to, you know, have people there because if you've got people there, you could do science, you know. Whilst there's no one there, you're limited in what you can do. So I imagine that that is the dream, that is one of the goals, but certainly the first Artemis missions will sort of go there, do their mission for weeks, months, then come back. It won't be continuous presence on the moon right at the start. Okay, makes sense. Will you be watching uh, the launch of Artemis 1 from Cape Canaveral? I really hope so. So, I mean, as you can imagine, everybody wants to go on the team. And <laughs> they can't send us all there because somebody needs to be back to do the work. But yeah. I'm hoping to take a bit of holiday and maybe privately go out there and watch it. Just because, I mean, the last, the last, I'm privileged that I've seen a spacecraft launch before, but I was eight years old and it was from really far away. It was a space shuttle. So I really, really want to experience a launch um to, to sort of feel the vibrations of the launch in my body um and also yeah just to witness something that we've all worked so hard for launching to space because i mean that's the thing these space projects are often quite long long lived you know like they take a long time to get from the initial idea through to launch so in your career you don't see 
huge amounts of launches. In fact, I mean, I've worked in the space industry now for 10 years and only one thing that I've worked on has launched into space so far in 10 years, you know? Okay, maybe that's a bit abnormal. Maybe other people have got two or three that they've seen. But for me, um, Artemis will be, you know, the second project I worked on that will actually launch into space and I'm determined to go and see it just because of how um how passionate I feel about this project as well it'll be good to see it yeah you just said uh the shuttle the space shuttles it, it already feels like ancient history that we actually observed space shuttles launch into space and it felt so sad when this project was also retired and I never saw a space shuttle launching but I saw one in the uh, California Science Center I think it's the Endeavor that is mm. uh, that is placed there and it it, it is so glorious just sitting there and I, I just wanted to touch it right it's like a piece of history and now that that we are talking about like the very ancient Apollo um, rockets and the space shuttle and now we are even losing the ISS but at the same time we are building something new right and uh, not only um, what Airbus is doing but also like Elon Musk and everything that he's planning for traveling to Mars it's so crazy what what is built in today's time and so I think it's really amazing that you are in the progress of making the next phase of history yeah absolutely and i'm always reminding myself of that you know i've got such a cool job i work on such a cool mission and something that will be it will go down in history and that everyone around the world will be talking about you know when it launches but you make a good point you know all of this stuff is so long ago now the apollo missions and the space shuttle but i was thinking this recently when you look around at like i don't know kids books or toys or just imagery of space we're still talking or we're still featuring Apollo type missions, sometimes space shuttles feature, but really old fashioned stuff. When you think about it, if you were to picture, I don't know, a, a kid's t-shirt that had something to do with space, it would be really old images. And I'm really excited about sort of this whole new chapter in, in space exploration and sort of reinvigorating, reminding people of the amazing things we can do as, as humankind. And also sort of giving us some new fodder, really. I think it's time that we had some new images, some new pictures, some new astronauts that we can relate to. And yeah, the experience of landing on the moon for a whole new generation, really. Yeah, yeah. A sentence that I regularly keep saying uh, whenever I feel overwhelmed with a task at, at work, I say to myself, um, you can do it. This is no rocket science. Like, this is <laughs> a very common saying. Uh, but in your case, your daily work literally is kind of rocket science. And as you said in the beginning, there's a high degree of responsibility bringing the, the astronauts into space and um, back in, in one piece. How does it feel to carry this degree of responsibility? Yeah, and trust me, people in the office will always crack out that line, oh, it is rocket science, you know. Um, but no, on a more serious note, I think for us, it's always the safety issue. This is the most challenging part. And that is the bit that we hold we hold an incredible amount of responsibility for that so our module is um the service module and it carries all of the air that the astronauts need to breathe all of the water that they need to drink it has um it controls the temperature of their capsule um, it provides the power so really it's the life support system taking these astronauts to the moon and i think we're all really acutely aware of that responsibility and that's why we do everything to the highest standards we check everything two three four times we have redundant systems so backups here there for everything and i reckon that yeah i think that the whole team feels that that's the biggest responsibility that we feel and yeah we have to take our jobs very seriously because of that we've got people's lives at stake you know Right. I saw uh, pictures of you on, I think, on LinkedIn, where you were dressed in these, uh, this protective gear. Um, I guess it was when you were working in the clean room, right, with all the very, very um, fine electronics and everything that goes into the spacecraft. How, how does a typical day look like in your job? Yes. So for me, I'm not often in the clean room. <laughs> Just um, sometimes <laughs> I used to go there a bit. I used to be the scheduler for um, ESM2. And sometimes I would go to check to see what had been integrated onto the spacecraft, where we were in the process. But most of the time, my day to day is, is an office job. I'm more on the management side of things. I sit at a desk with the computer some Excel spreadsheets, some collaborative working platforms, nothing groundbreaking, you know, the same as any other 
office job, I would imagine. It's just a little bit different because, you know, literally 100 metres over my shoulder is the spacecraft in this clean room. Um, and a lot of my colleagues are in there a lot doing the physical integration or um, problem solving or, you know, finding finding solutions for for certain issues I guess and so that's when they would be in the clean room in all of that protective gear there's a whole process that you've got to go through and um, you have to put on the clothes in a certain order you've got to walk over um, a little mat that will take any dirt off um, the bottom of your protective shoes um, uh, all sorts of things there's a lot of rules in there and that's all because um, uh, yeah I should explain I mean the there's like you say there's a lot of sensitive electronics in there so we can't afford to have any uh, I don't know hair or skin particles or dust getting in and shorting circuits there's also um, an element of protecting the spacecraft itself from knocks and bumps and just general dirt we have to make everything as clean as we possibly can because that's how we can almost guarantee that it's going to work properly if we keep the environment constant. So the clean room itself is um, I, apparently as clean as, or maybe even cleaner than an operating theater. The air, the air gets all recycled. It's very, very rare that you see any dust in there. You really shouldn't. <laughs> um, and we do that, yeah, just to, to try to make sure that everything works perfectly. Um, and yeah, that we're shipping a, a pristine spacecraft, you know, rather than something that's been gathering dust for a while. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think everyone involved um, is, is really appreciating this. <laughs> I have another question regarding Mars, because in the long run, as you said, Orion is supposed to also travel to Mars, right? And the, the European, uh, the, the ESM is also being prepared, I guess, for this longer travel. How does this work with life support and the propellant? Will this be compatible with this very long travel to Mars or do you have to rethink the whole system? Do you know, that's a really good question that I don't know the proper answer to. I do know that when the project came about, um, we used to call it MPCV, multi-purpose crew vehicle. And it was designed very much with different missions in mind. It wasn't designed just to get us to the moon and back. It was designed so that it would have the capability to take cargo to the moon, to take parts of this uh, this new space station to the moon. And I'm sure that I'm right when I say that it was also designed with longer missions in mind as well. Whether that's still the case over the years as things have evolved and developed, I'm not entirely sure. Because I know that if you go to Mars, like you say, it's very different requirements. It takes months to get to Mars. You need a completely different propulsion system. And you also then need quite a lot different in terms of the habitable environment for the astronauts. You know, the astronauts can sit in a small space for the days that it takes to get to the moon. But then if you're suddenly thinking about going to Mars, that's very different. They're there for months. They need to be able to move around. They need to be able to potentially grow their own food on the mission, that sort of thing. So in that respect, when I think of it like that, I would be surprised if the Orion spacecraft, as it looks now, goes to Mars. But what I imagine would happen would be some sort of development build building off that design, building off the technology, reusing as much as we can um, and developing that into something that can get us further afield and onto Mars. Yeah, I, I already subscribe to all newsletters that I can can grab to stay updated to everything that is that is developed. But yeah, it, it was really great listening to all of these stories. Is there anything else you want to tell the space enthusiasts who are listening to you right now? Oh, I guess for the for the younger ones, or maybe even for those who are just thinking of changing career, there are options out there. You've just got to be a little bit imaginative. You've got to be a bit patient. Do your research. I think that's where I fell down. I really didn't know what was on offer in, in the space industry until I ended up there. And um, there's all sorts of summer schools, space schools, internships with all of these space companies. So get involved in those if that's something that you're interested in, because that's really your route in. And then if that's not an option, if that's not your thing, then just look up at the stars. Because to me, that's my sort of happy place when I'm, you know, out there on a nice clear night, looking up at stars and seeing satellites uh, flying over, seeing shooting stars, recognizing constellations. Yeah, that's what I would say for any any space nerd who's not quite ready to go into space themselves, then yeah get your fix from the stars that yeah that is true i remember i think when i was 10 years old or 12 years old i i begged my parents to save like all the money for the next three birthdays uh, just to get me a telescope because oh. i was so eager to look at the moon in, in a close-up mm -hmm. or actually see details of a planet or the moons of of uh, jupiter or something something exactly yeah, and I it's was, amazing i loved it so much it's amazing 
even what you can see with like even a small telescope. Like I think I started right. off with a bird watching telescope that I sort of got from my granddad. And even with that, you can start to see like the rings of Saturn and maybe the bands of color on Jupiter if you're lucky. So yeah, yes. I don't think that it has to be um, too prohibitive for the vast majority of people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I love it so much. Thank you so much, Sean, for your time and all of these amazing insights into Artemis and um, of course the work as an industrial manager and spacecraft engineer. I, I really appreciate it. And I hope that we can talk again, maybe after the launch or latest next year, next year, Artemis 2, will it be next year? Or? Uh, the year after, I believe. Yeah, yeah okay. 2024, yeah. yeah, for Artemis 2. But for then, sure, then... I'd love to keep you updated <laughs> um, and to share well, more, more stories from the Artemis program. I'd love it. And I will collect a lot of feedback for, from this interview. And let's see what are the, the burning topics then. So thank you for now and have a wonderful night. You're welcome. Thank you so much.